complex sales are, by nature, complex. And that means this is a very big topic. Back in the late 1990s, I went on a two day course. So this video, by its very nature, it needs to be a summary of what I best remember and have most used from that course. A complex sale 101. Let's start with what makes a complex sale. And there are a number of factors. Multiple geographies for both the vendor and the customer. Multiple products and services. Potentially multiple partners involved on either side. And what about the multiple senior managers and executives all trying to get some of the credit for the sale or the purchase? There are often long sales cycles with multiple stages. Almost certainly multiple decision makers and huge loads of data and information to assimilate. And finally, typically, complex politics. This all requires the sales team to adopt a wide range of strategies and techniques to accommodate the different levels of complexity and complication. But the complex sale always starts with a potential client. What's their pain? Their personal pain and their organisational pain. What are the causes and what are the effects of that pain? What do they want? What's their buying process and their decision-making process? Who has the power? What are their agendas? And how does the politics work? From all of this, you then build a plan that harnesses your products or your services competitive advantages. You'll include things like proprietary products or processes, your experience and your expertise, your service levels and support systems, partnerships and alliances, your track record, along with case studies and endorsements to demonstrate it, and evidence of your financial stability and your industry reputation. It's also worth considering which core market strategy you'll deploy. Michael Porter identified three core strategies. Cost leadership, that is you offer the lowest price products or services. Differentiation, that is you offer products and services which are significantly different from those of your competitors. Or niche focus. You demonstrate yourself to be expert in a narrow niche, which makes you the prime candidate for a customer that wants to buy something in that niche. In addition to Porter's famous three strategies, there is a fourth strategy, which is brand focus or brand loyalty. That is to say, you build a brand that people simply want to be a part of and relate to. However, this strategy is far more successful and prevalent in the consumer sector. Commercial or business to business buyers tend not to buy on brand loyalty. Now let's consider the complex customer. In a complex sale, you are likely to be dealing with multiple stakeholders within the buying organisation, each of them with a part in the buying process and potentially many of them being actively engaged in the buying decisions. Each of them will have different needs and different approaches to evaluating their decisions. These will range across different attitudes who either see the buying decision as being about a commodity, a competition, a solution to a problem or an opportunity or a partnership. You need to adopt a communication style accordingly. You need to match your style 
to the approach that the buyer will be taking. But through all of this, you want to do two things. First, you want to identify the true decision makers, those who have a real impact on the final decision and the process by which it's made. Secondly, you want to move the way that these people perceive the transaction onto the ground that best suits you, which is almost certainly going to be a partnership approach. The complex sale is going to be a team effort. So at your end, you need to build a team. If you've not done this before or if you need a refresher, do take a look at our course on teams. But in summary, here are some key things to think about. Everyone on the team needs to get to know one another and build a trust throughout the team. The team needs to agree on its goals and on its processes. And it needs to establish good communication processes for every scenario. You need to work together to agree the messages you will deliver, particularly around the value of your proposition. You'll need to manage egos and competing agendas, particularly because in a complex sale, there is a large win to be had. Careers can be made or broken on the complex sale process. And finally, you have to handle the logistics of the geography and the complexities of the different cultures that are part of your team. But remember, if you are making a complex sale to a multi-geography client or customer, then it makes good sense to match the balance of cultures of the buying organisation with as close a similarity of cultures in the selling organisation team. As I alluded to earlier, your master strategy should be to promote a partnership approach as part of your complex sale. The reason for this is simple. If you are going to invest a large amount of time and a large amount of resources and, let's face it, a large budget in the complex sale, then you are best served by getting as close to the potential customer as you possibly can. At the very least, you need to pursue a solution selling approach. Why would you dedicate so much resource? Why would you devote so much resource to an off the shelf product or service? Ideally, however, you want to build a relationship and set an expectation for a partnership approach. This is where the value you can deliver will be at its highest. To do this, however, you need to be confident of two things. First, that you can build a relationship of trust with the key decision makers. And secondly, that you'll be able to sell based on the value that you can deliver, rather than on capricious factors like price, or old relationships, or prejudices about you or about your competitors. But if you can do this, there are many benefits to the partnership approach. These include a lower sensitivity to price, an insider status that allows you to fine tune the proposition that you're going to be making, an ability to identify unmet needs and additional opportunities a competitive advantage that will naturally arise from a deeper level of understanding and stronger relationships. And possibly, the ultimate goal, a preferred supplier status. There are a number of ways that you can grow your partnership relationship and outcompete your rivals. Let's take a look at some. First, you can seek to avoid competition by offering a unique product or service as a solution to your prospect's problems. To do this, you have to be prepared to assemble an unrivaled team and possibly build partnerships with other suppliers to put together a package that nobody else can match. Second, you could put together an overwhelming offer that is hard for the prospect to resist. Here, 
you're putting together a level of service and a set of commercial terms that your rivals will be unable to match. Thirdly, you can start with where you have a natural advantage and then frame your prospect's problems creatively so that your products and services are in the sweet spot for solving them. The fourth strategy is to use a thin slicing approach of addressing only a small but easy to win part of the opportunity, perhaps in a small niche, and then using that sale and the relationship it builds as a way of expanding your influence within the client organization. From here, you can strengthen your relationships, your partnership and the level of trust. A lot of the consulting organizations refer to this strategy as land and expand. If you are behind the curve and fear that you're losing out against your competitors, then your best strategy is to delay the process if you possibly can. Raise legitimate concerns to instill a level of uncertainty, concern or even fear in your potential client to give you time to reconsider your commercial approach and make a better offer. If, on the other hand, you are in a strong position and confident that you can and maybe will win, then it is in your interest try to persuade the client to move as quickly as possible to block out your competitors. To support all of these strategies, there is also a whole raft of tactical tools and approaches that you can deploy to help you win the complex sale. Identify the issues and the risks that your prospect faces. Seek to influence the process by helping to define the right criteria for evaluating options. Introduce case studies and arrange for reference visits that will allow your prospect to meet some of your happy clients. Build relationships between all of your team members and their opposite numbers within the prospect's organisation. Understand the power structure within the client organisation and how the relationships work within that power structure. Offer thought leadership and insights from your experts or even commission external third-party experts to provide thought leadership and insight. Conduct surveys to provide valuable business intelligence that applies to this particular opportunity. Prepare for objection handling with red team reviews and team rehearsals where other people play the part of the buying organisation. And finally, use the principle of continuity. Never leave a conversation without making arrangements for the next one. Among all of these tactics, perhaps the most important is understanding the power structures and the decision-making process and who is involved in that process and the roles that they play. And indeed, there are many roles that people can play in influencing the final buying decision. These roles include the decision makers themselves, financial controllers, finance directors and CFOs, and financial analysts, procurement executives, contract managers, subject matter experts, administrators and other resource gatekeepers, formal evaluators, consultants and other trusted advisors, internal review, internal audit and quality assurance teams, users and user groups, and finally, political players who have agendas. You need to be aware of all of these and maybe more. And you need to be building relationships with all of them, understand their points of view, and to figure out how best to influence and persuade them. This way, you can borrow influence from a range of people within the organisation to help support the sale. Oh, and by the way, if you want to understand power in the organisation, I have a whole series on the nature of organisations 
with a section, a number of videos on power. A great one to start with is the one about French and Raven's model of social power bases. I'll put links in the description to this video. Let's end with an important concept in selling, which is particularly relevant in the complex sale. And that concept is the concept of the crucible. The crucible refers to the point in a complex sale where you are close to making that sale. Here, it often happens that all the reason and the logic that have got you this far start to fade into the background. Taking over the process are emotions, and political agendas, which can hijack the whole decision making process. The crucible is the most dangerous part of a complex sale. So, in a complex sale, as you get closer to winning it, you also get closer to losing it. And of course, with all of the costs and the time and the effort that you've invested into the sale, this is where the stakes are highest. In the crucible, the buying criteria can flip suddenly from rational and logical criteria to emotional and political criteria. Here, a winning formal proposal that has met all of the evaluation criteria can suddenly look like losing. Big decisions are often won or lost on emotion and politics. Because let's face it, all decisions are fundamentally made on an emotional level. We use the logic and the reason to justify those decisions, either to ourselves or to the organisations around us. So typically, in the crucible, the buyer's priorities will shift. They'll shift from things like quality and capability to things like risk and price. And the reason is simple. Now they're facing making a commitment. They know they're going to have to live with that commitment. So you need to have your arguments ready. You need to be able to respond calmly, efficiently to whatever concerns come up. But there is good news if this happens, because if your prospect is raising questions about price and risk, it means they are seriously considering buying your proposal. They have satisfied themselves about the capabilities and the quality that you're offering. Now they're thinking about how they can optimise the deal. As a result, this is where you may need to negotiate a little more than you originally proposed. Knowing the crucible is going to happen, of course, means that when you make your formal proposal, you can have a little in your back pocket to give away if you need to during the crucible. So your prospect is serious about the possibility of saying yes, means you need to listen carefully and respond in a measured way. But your prospect isn't the only party in this game that can respond in an emotional way. So can you and your colleagues. And so too can your competitors. This is where their actions become hard to predict. They can act crazy. They can make a big and unexpected play at the last moment. And you need to be ready for it. Once you enter the crucible, then if you are out in front or you believe that you're out in front, it is in your interest to move as quickly as possible, to respond rapidly to every inquiry, to take every meeting as soon as you can. If on the other hand, you feel that one of your competitors is out in front, then you need to slow the process down. Take as much time as you're able to respond to inquiries. Delay holding meetings for as long as you can without causing offence. And always stay alert for new issues emerging or for changes in the process. To do this, everyone on your team needs to stay in as close a touch with their contacts as possible. 
The sooner you learn of any bad news, the greater the scope you have for dealing with the problem resourcefully. The crucible will come. Handle it well and don't lose the advantage of all the hard work you've done in getting you that far in your complex sale. Please do give this video a like if you've learned from it or if you've enjoyed it. I'll be making loads more great management courses videos for you, so please do subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so you don't miss any of them. I look forward to seeing you in the next video, and in the meantime, keep learning.